Before we could, I wish to make one further point. There are many reflections on Sir David Amos's decency and kindness at a very moving Requiem Mass held yesterday. I sincerely hope that those qualities of kindness, decency, are reflected in our proceedings today and in the future. I now call the Prime Minister. Chris Bryant, number one. Number one, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, this morning I had... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Immediately following PMQs, I will attend. I will attend the welcome home marching to thank all those involved in pitting our evacuation from Kabul. In addition to my duties in this house, I shall have further such meetings later today. Chris Bryant, I, I too will be attending in a. In, I, I too will be attending in a few minutes. Nicky's seven-year-old son had 37 seizures a day because of a brain disease he suffered from. He's had surgery now, but it's a struggle every day to get him to stay in school. Um, she, Nicky, is supporting the Acquired Brain Injury Bill because she believes that the government needs to have a cross-departmental strategy for supporting those who've had an acquired brain injury, whether that's yeah. um, rugby players with concussion and dementia, um, it's women who've been um, beaten in the head by their partners. Um, it's people who've had brain injuries uh, due to um, uh, it's children who've had, uh, suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning, soldiers who've been in explosions. I really hope that the government is going to back the acquired brain injury bill. But above all, we need a strategy to help the 1.4 million people in this country. Will he give us that? Yeah. Prime Minister. I want to thank the, the Right Honourable Member for raising this vital issue and for his commitment to this, to this cause, his personal commitment. And I can assure him that uh, we are studying his uh, proposed bill and uh, working to ensure that people uh, do get the support for the acquired uh, brain injuries that they uh, have, have received. And what we can certainly pledge at this stage to do, and I hope this will be uh, of some uh, use to him and the many who care about this uh, issue in the way that he does, and as I'm sure members do across the House, uh, uh, the Department of Health and Social Care will lead on the development of a cross departmental government strategy on acquired brain injury and other neurological uh, conditions. I'll be uh, very happy to share details with him uh, shortly. Felicity Buckham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In July of this year, my constituency, Kensington, suffered devastating flooding, with more than 2,000 homes flooded, a river running down Portobello Road, and a lot of residents having to move into temporary accommodation. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that Thames Water needs to come up with short and long-term solutions, and they need to make sufficient investment in infrastructure to prevent events like this happening again? Yes. Uh, Prime my, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise flooding, Mr Speaker, and she's right about short and long-term uh, solutions, and that's why I'm proud amongst other things to have helped to instigate the Thames Tideway Tunnel, uh, with the, the biggest super sewer in the, in the history of this country, uh, which will help to deal with what happens uh, in London when the basal jet interceptors overflow and to deal with flooding uh, throughout the city. Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. At the last election, the Prime Minister promised that nobody would have to sell their home to pay for care. That's another broken promise, isn't it? Prime Minister. No, no, Mr Speaker. No, Mr Speaker. Uh, because, because if he looked at what we are proposing and if he supported what we are proposing, which is fixing something that uh, Labour never fixed in all their years in office, Mr Speaker, we are saying to the people of this country that we will disregard your home as part of your assets if you and your spouse are living in it. And, and number two, Mr Speaker, uh, we, you can have a deferred payments agreement if you, if you move out of it and you're living in, in residential care. You can have a deferred payments agreement. But most important of all, Mr Speaker, by putting the huge investment that we are making now in health and social care, we are allowing for the first time the people of this country to insure themselves against the potentially catastrophic, the otherwise
otherwise catastrophic costs of, of dementia or Alzheimer's, Mr Speaker. And uh, uh, even if you're not one of the, 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 those people who suffer from those afflictions, we are taking away the anxiety from millions of people, millions of people up and down the land about their homes. Yeah. I think the Prime Minister just described the broken system he said he was fixing. So it's certainly not a straight answer. Let, let, let's have another go. Let's have another go. He used to say, he used to say, he used to... I see they turned up this week, Prime Minister. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, he used to say, he used to say that... Sorry. I don't think I need any further. Yesterday we had a very good example of the house being at its best in that church, in that cathedral. Please, let's show some respect. I want to be able to hear not only the Prime Minister but the Leader of the Opposition. Shouting each other down doesn't do you or your constituents any good. We need to hear the questions and I certainly need to hear the answers. And if anybody doesn't like it, please leave now. Yes, Sama. Mr Speaker, it's not a complicated question, so let's have another go. He used to say that nobody would have to sell their home to pay for their care. It's in his manifesto right here. On the basis of that promise, he then put up tax on every working person in the country. So has he done what he promised and ensured that nobody will have to sell their home to pay for care? Yes or no? It's not complicated. Prime yeah. Minister. No, no, it's not complicated, Mr Speaker, uh, because, we're not, because what we're doing uh, is disregarding your home as part of the assets uh, that we calculate. So to, if you go down uh, to £100,000, uh, that's, the, that's the beginning uh, where we will ask you to, to contribute. But your home is not included in that. Uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, they, have, they have absolutely no plan. They've spent decades uh, failing to address this. And uh, only, a f only a few weeks ago, Mr Speaker, they failed, to, uh, they failed to vote for the £36 billion pounds that will enable us uh, to fix this and to help people up and down the country, uh, not, just to, not just to fix the social care uh, problem, but to pay for people to live in their own homes, Mr Speaker, and receive the care they need in their homes. That's what this One Nation Conservative government is doing. Why won't it support it? Mr Speaker has had two opportunities to stand by his manifesto commitment. He's not taken them. So, well, it says he just has. So, so let, let's test this in the real world, Prime Minister. Under the Prime Minister's plans, a, person's with a, a person with assets worth about £100,000, most of it turned up in their home, would have to pay £80,000. They'd lose almost everything. How on earth... How on earth does the Prime Minister think that they can get their hands on that kind of money without selling their home? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm going to have a third try go of trying to uh, clear this up in, the, in the, fu the befuddled mind of the right honourable gentleman opposite. Because, and it, because it, is, it is important, and uh, the fact is that the party opposite have totally failed to address it. They haven't had the guts to fix this uh, in all their time in office. It's something left over, it's something left over uh, from from the Attlee government, and we are fixing it. And as I, uh, let, me repeat, let me repeat for the third time, Mr Speaker, since, since well, your home is disregarded. Number two, uh, even, if you have, even if you have a, a second home here in your residential care, Mr Speaker, you have a deferred payments agreement. If you want. And number three, Mr Speaker, we are allowing you to insure yourself for the first time against the catastrophic consequences by capping it at 86,000, Mr Speaker. And uh, he stood on a manifesto to put the cap where? Mr. Speaker, at £100,000, Mr. Speaker. Dear Starmer. The, the, the question was very simple, and it's, it's the question all of his backbench not If you've got a house worth about £120,000, £140,000, how do you find £80,000 without selling your home? It's common sense. Strip away the bluster, strip away the deflection. Strip away the refusal to answer the question. There's a simple truth, and this is why the Prime Minister won't address it. People will still be forced to sell their homes to pay for care. That accounts... Why did they... Look at the vote the other day to see the answer to that question. They'll still be forced to sell their homes. It's another broken promise. Just like, just like he promised that he wouldn't put up tax. Just like he promised 40 new hospitals. Just like he promised a rail revolution in the north. <laughs> Mr Speaker, 
Mr Speaker, who knows, who knows if he'll make it to the next election? But if he does, how does he expect anyone to take him and his promises seriously? Uh, Mr Speaker, yet again he raises the, the rail revolution in, in the north. And uh, uh, it, 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 the three new high speed lines, Mr Speaker. 96, 96, 96 billion pounds. Nothing like it. Again, nothing like it, nothing like it, nothing like it, Mr Speaker, nothing like it for a century. And, and, and just, just for the advantage of, of, of I didn't, I didn't even know this. I was in a state of complete innocence about this last week, Mr. Speaker. But it turns out that the right honourable gentleman actually campaigned against yeah. HS2 altogether, and, and, and said it would be devastating, and said it should be cancelled. I can tell you something, Mr. Speaker. HS2 runs through my constituency as well. And I took a decision, even though it's been very tough for my constituents, I took it I could have took a decision that it was in the right it was the right thing to do for the long term interests of the whole country. How can they possibly trust that man? Yeah. Mr. S- Mr Speaker, I think he's lost his place in his notes again. Yeah. The, the only the, the only thing the only thing he's delivering is high taxes, high prices and low growth. I'm not sure the Prime Minister should be shouting about that. And it isn't just broken promises, it's also about fairness. Everyone needs protection against massive health and care costs. But under his plan, someone with assets worth about £100,000 will lose almost everything. Yet somebody with assets of about a million pounds will keep almost everything. It's just like it's just like their 2017 manifesto all over again. Only this time something has changed. He's picked the pockets of working people to protect the estates of the wealthiest. How, how could he possibly have managed to devise a working class dementia tax? Mr Speaker, he, he, I, I think I've answered that question three times uh, th- uh, already. This, is, this, this, does more, this does more for working people up and down the country than Labour ever did, uh, and Labour ever did uh, uh, because we're actually solving the problem that they failed to address. We're disregarding your housing asset altogether, Mr Speaker, while you're in it. And he talks about jobs, he talks about working people. Well, well let, let, me, let me just remind you, there's just one key statistic that people should, should bear in mind. Uh, it's now almost a month after furlough ended. He talks about the, the economy, Mr Speaker. There are now more people in work than there were before the pandemic began. And that's because of the policies this government has pursued. Here's Starmer. Mr Speaker, there's no getting away from it. Working people are being asked to pay twice. During their working lives, they'll pay much more tax in national insurance whilst those living off wealth are protected. And then when they retire, Mr Speaker, they face having to sell their home when the wealthiest won't have to do so. It's a classic con game, a Covent Garden pickpocketing operation. The Prime Minister's the front man, distracting people with wild promises and panto speeches, whilst his Chancellor dips his hand in their pocket. But now... But now the Prime Minister's routine is falling flat. His Chancellor is worried that people are getting wise. His backbenchers say it's embarrassing. Your words. (laughs) Your words. Your words. And, and, And senior people in Downing Street tell the BBC it's just not working. Is everything OK, Prime Minister? <laughs> Prime Minister! Well, Mr Speaker, I, I tell you what's not working. It's that line of attack. I just want to repeat... I want to I will, I will, I will, I will repeat the, the, the crucial point, uh, Mr Speaker. We're delivering for the working people of this country. We're delivering for the people of this country. And, 
were fixing the problems that they thought could never be fixed, were doing the things that they thought were impossible. And let, let me repeat, there are now more people, more people in work in this country, jobs up with their wages going up, Mr Speaker, than there were before the pandemic began. And that is because of the policies that this government has followed, uh, whether it's on rolling out the vaccine, if you remember uh, that he, he opposed, uh, whether it's on investment, uh, that he, but he did. Mr. He, he, he didn't want to invest in the in the vaccine task force. I seem to remember. I seem to remember. Where, or whether, or whether, or whether it is making the strategic investments that we have. If we listened, if we listened to Captain Hindsight, Mr. Speaker, we would have no HS2 at all, because that was what he stood for. And if we listened to him, we would all still be in lockdown, Mr. Speaker. Firm that he will use the rest of the UK's presidency of COP to urge countries around the world to make good on the pledges that they made in Glasgow. And does he agree with me that decarbonisation can create millions of jobs across the UK and around the world? Prime Minister. I, I, I totally agree with my right honourable friend who's right about this and many other things. Uh, and that's why our transition to, to green jobs is, is, is supporting 440,000 uh, new green high wage high school jobs across the, the UK uh, and uh, the breakthrough agenda that we had endorsed at COP26 uh, I believe will support between 20 and 30 uh, million jobs across the world by 2030 and I think that's probably uh, a gross underestimate. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you Mr Speaker. I'm sure you will wish to join me and indeed the rest of the House in welcoming the moderator of the Church of Scotland to the gallery today, Lord Wallace, and to thank him for his sage words at his sermon this morning. Uh, Mr Speaker, the past few weeks have shown this Tory government at its very worst. A Tory sleaze and corruption scandal on a scale not seen since the 1990s. Tory cuts and tax rises that will leave millions of people worse off. A litany of broken promises from HS2 to carbon capture, social yeah. care, yeah. the triple lock on pensions. Yeah. And who can possibly forget the £20 billion bridge to Ireland that evaporated <laughs> into thin air? At the centre of all this is one man, a Prime Minister who is floundering in failure. Yeah. So, can I ask the Prime Minister, with his party falling in the polls, his colleagues briefing against him, has he considered calling it a day before he's pushed out the door? Mr. Speaker, well, I, I think what the people in this country want to hear is less talk about uh, politics and politics, and they want to talk about what the government is doing for the people of Scotland and, and, what, the, and what the Scottish government is doing for the people of Scotland, uh, which isn't enough. Uh, Mr. Speaker, but what we will do, he talks about uh, infrastructure investment, and I can tell him that if he, if he, if he, if he will wait till, uh, I think, or, till Friday or later this week, he's going to hear about what we're going to do with the Union Connectivity Review to ensure that the people of Scotland are served uh, with the connections that they need and which the Scottish Nationalist Party has totally failed to put in. In Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That certainly wasn't an answer to the question I asked, but we're used to that. And I didn't expect the Prime Minister to take responsibility because he never does. But this isn't just about the chaos in the Conservative Party. It's about the state of the United Kingdom under his failing leadership. Because whilst the Prime Minister spends his time hunting for chatty pigs and staving off a leadership challenge from the Treasury, in the real world, in the real world, Mr Speaker, people are suffering a Tory cost of living crisis. Brexit is hitting the economy hard, but the Prime Minister can't even give a coherent speech to business. The Prime Minister's officials have lost confidence in him. Tory MPs have lost confidence in him. The letters are going in, and the public have lost confidence in him. Why is he clinging on when quite clearly he simply isn't up to the job? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I might ask the, the right honourable gentleman what on earth uh, he thinks he is doing, uh, talking about uh, 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 party political issues when the, what the people of, of Scotland want to hear is what on earth uh, the Scottish National Government uh, is doing. They're falling in the polls, uh, Mr Speaker. I think, I think, uh, 
their cause, the yes they are, their cause is falling in the polls. And considering, considering their manifold failures on tax, on education and all the things the people of Scotland really care about, I'm not surprised. And I can see some agreement on the benches opposite. Jonathan Lord. Mr Speaker, I, I celebrate the recent successes of Woking College, my local uh, sixth form college, and I welcome the recent government investment for a new teaching block which will allow it to expand. Many colleges and students find BTEX to be a really valuable uh, qualification and course uh, enabling progress into higher education and skilled employ employment. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that we should protect student choice and keep BTEX as an option for students? Yes, Mr. Speaker, we will continue. I thank my honourable We will continue to fund uh, some BTEX where there's a clear need for them. Uh, but I must stress to him uh, that we've got to close the gap between uh, the things that people study and the needs of business and employers, and that's what T levels are designed to do. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I rarely agree with the Prime Minister, but last week when he said that COP26 showed that we can end our reliance on fossil fuels, I did agree with him. But that begs the question as to why his government is pressing ahead, not just with the Cambo oil field, but with 39 other oil, gas and coal developments, which would amount to three times the UK's current annual climate emissions. Now, I don't want an answer about all the things he thinks he is doing on cars and cash and trees. I want him to tell the House if he will leave those fossil fuels in the ground, will he cancel those projects? And does he recognise that if he doesn't, he will need to ask for forgiveness, not just for losing his place in a speech, but for losing the future of our children? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we are not only powering past coal, going to uh, going to an end to, to uh, fossil fuel reliance in our, uh, our, our energy generation at all uh, by 2024, which is an absolutely stunning thing ahead of, uh, of countries around the world. I'm, I'm glad that she's uh, praising me for that. The, the, the Cambo oil field, uh, as she knows, is, is for study by an independent regulator. But what we, what we have also done and led the world in this, Mr Speaker, is stopped the financing of overseas hydrocarbons. And that is a fantastic thing which the whole world followed. Dr Andrew Burris. Mr Speaker, net zero, levelling up and building back better can't happen unless we have a massive increase in the supply of critical tech minerals like silicon, copper and lithium. But Beijing controls most of them. Oh Noting China's recent tech minerals leverage on Japan, does he agree with me that the success of our green industrial revolution hinges on advancing our indigenous silicon valley? And free of the EU, what fiscal incentives can he now provide to make it happen at pace? Minister. I, I thank my, my honourable friend for that. And uh, As he knows, there are some uh, very, very interesting and potentially very lucrative sources of, uh, of minerals such as lithium in this country, which, uh, whose uh, exploration, discovery and, uh, and reuse we, we are encouraging. Uh, but secondly, on the, on the tax point that he rightly uh, raises, we're going to use free ports to uh, ensure that we uh, support the, uh, them as hubs for the processing of those critical uh, minerals here in the UK. Current. Thank you. Mr Speaker, in 2014, my constituent's three-year-old son, Freddie Hussey, was killed by an unsafe trailer. Every year, 30% of people who do the B plus E test fail it. And now the government is abolishing that test, yeah. unleashing thousands of untrained, yeah. untested, unsafe drivers onto our roads. Why is the government breaking its promise to grieving families to make towing and our roads safer? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I, I thank her very much for raising this uh, with me, and, uh, I, and I'm very sorry to hear about the tragic circumstances of, uh, of, of Freddie's death. And what we, what we want to do is to, uh, is to free up B&E licensing uh, time so that we get more people qualified as HGV drivers, but that cannot compromise road safety, as she, as she rightly says. Uh, so we will, we will review the legislation and its consequences at regular intervals. Thank you, Speaker. On the 2nd to 5th of December, Lincoln will be hosting its world famous Christmas market in the grounds of the historic. Oh. And it will be
be remiss of me not to invite my honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and, and yourself, Speaker, and all other colleagues, even the opposition front bench, to come and enjoy the marvellous long weekend of, of festi festivities. However, what is less than marvellous for my constituents is the levelling down of Lincolnshire's highway maintenance grant by 25% on 2019 to 2020 levels. Can my honourable friend use his influence to cause the Treasury and DFT to revisit this unfortunate decision? Restoring this grant back to 1920 levels is imperative to the safety of my constituents, whether in vehicles, cycling or walking, as I would hope my right honourable friend would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I thank you very much for the question. I, I'll do my, uh, my utmost, uh, uh, as I'm sure all other... Uh, I think he's invited everybody. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure <laughs> a lot of people are going to be going to Lincoln, uh, I hope. Uh, uh, but I, I'm sure that my right, right old friend, the Secretary of State for, for Transport, will have listened very carefully uh, to what he had to say. Hannah Baldell. Inexplicable, Mr Speaker, is how former Vaccine Task Force Chair Kate Bingham described his government's decision to cancel its contract with Livingston-based vaccine developer Valneva, a company the Prime Minister has himself visited. She also noted how shoddily Valneva have been treated and how damaging his government's decision has been for UK life sciences, exports and for jobs in my Livingston constituency, where a state-of-the-art vaccine manufacturing plant now lies unfinished. There has been no apology to the incorrect statements in the House, so can the Prime Minister please meet with me and representatives from Valneva, and will he tell me whether his government has tabled any proposals to reach an amicable resolution which was promised at the dispatch box, and if not, when will he do so? Yes, I, I, want to, I thank her very much. I, I, was, I was personally very disappointed when we couldn't get approval for the, uh, for the Valneva vaccine in the way that, uh, that we had hoped, and I know how disappointing uh, that was to uh, to, to colleagues in, in Scotland. Uh, I will certainly make sure that she gets the, the relevant meeting. Uh, but what we are doing is investing massively in this country's vaccine capability uh, across the country so that we are prepared uh, for the next pandemic. And I very much hope that Val Neva will be part of that. Nigel Bills. Thank you. We know that serious side effects from the COVID vaccines are very rare. But for my constituent, Sarah Kite, that wasn't the case. And she suffered a very serious reaction, leaving her in constant pain and losing most of her eyesight, and she now can't work. The Prime Minister successfully and quite rightly speaking that all the vaccine processes, except one, the vaccine damage payment system. But can we now get on with making those payments so people who have suffered these very, very serious reactions can get the financial support they need? Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, I, I thank him very much, and uh, I, I just want to, to, to reassure, me, reassure him, and, and indeed to reassure the, the House and the, the country, that cases such as the very sad one that he raises are extremely, extremely rare, and we're putting more, uh, more money in uh, to gather evidence for claims uh, such as the one that he describes. But I want to repeat uh, perhaps the most important message I can, I can get across again today, Mr Speaker. I want to repeat how vital uh, that vaccination programme is, how safe it is, and how important it is that everybody uh, who is eligible gets their, gets their booster when they're called. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government's integrated review concluded that the Chinese state poses a systemic challenge to our national security, and the Prime Minister has made clear that when it comes to China, we must remain vigilant about our critical national infrastructure. Can he therefore confirm today, unequivocally, that plans for China General Nuclear to own and operate its own plant in Bradwell in Essex have been abandoned, and explain to the House precisely how and when his government intends to remove CGN's interest? from the size we'll see nuclear project here. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I thank him very much for, the very, for his question, a very important issue that he, that he raises, and uh, clearly one of the, the, the consequences of our, uh, of our approach uh, on critical national infrastructure, the National Security and Investment Bill, uh, is that we don't uh, want to see uh, undue influence uh, uh, by uh, potentially uh, uh, adversarial uh, countries in our critical national infrastructure, and so uh, that's why we've taken the decisions that we, that we have. And on Bradwell, on Bradwell, uh, there will be uh, more, more information forthcoming. But I, I want I, what I don't want. I, I, what I don't want to do, Mr. Speaker, is pitchfork away uh, wantonly all Chinese investment in this country or minimise the importance of this country of having a having a, a trading relationship with with China. Daniel Kuczynski. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister will be very pleased that Shrewsbury Conservatives are doing everything possible to help Neil Shastri Hurst, the excellent candidate in North Shropshire. But he will also know that the number one issue affecting Salopians at the moment 
is the £312 million that we've secured for a modernisation of our AND services. This has suffered terrible delays over the last eight years, leading to a worsening of our a and &E, uh, services for local patients. Will he do everything possible to help us get this finally across the line so that we can provide safe a and &E services for all the people of Shropshire and Mid Wales? Prime Minister. I thank him very much, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're investing £36 billion more in our NHS now to help cope with the, the, the backlog, the extra winter pressures, particularly on a &E. uh, but it's also a reason why uh, the booster programme is, is so vital, because we don't want those, those beds uh, filled with COVID patients, and we don't want uh, delayed discharges either. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. So far, has Government have found billions for nuclear, but nothing for Scottish carbon a capture cluster, nothing for pump storage hydro, and now are at risk of failing the tidal stream generation, a technology Scotland's a world leader in. Now, the ask is for a £71 million ring fence marine port in next month's energy auction. So, Prime Minister's got a choice provide this money and allow continued scale up commercial success based on a UK supply chain or see the manufacturing jobs move abroad, what's it going to be? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm so glad he asked that question, uh, because uh, I can tell him, and I can tell his, uh, his right honourable friend, uh, the leaders uh, of the SNP uh, in Westminster, that we will be including a, a, a support for, a, uh, for Tidal Stream, for, for Tidal Stream uh, in the upcoming, uh, to the value of £20 million. Pounds. Come on. Not to be sneezed at, not to be, sne not, not to be sneezed at, Mr. Speaker. In the upcoming uh, contract for difference auction, I've, I've met representatives of, of Scottish Tidal Power. I think it's, it's fantastic, original, inventive what they're doing. Uh, we want to support it. So, David Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, I've been out campaigning with our excellent candidate in Bexley, yeah, yeah. Louis French, yeah, yeah, yeah. for the by election. And responses on the doorstep are very good. Can can my well, the opposition know nothing as usual. Uh, can my right honourable friend confirm that he will continue to implement our 2019 manifesto and implement policies to ensure that we build up better for the whole country, including London, because this is what the electors in Bexley want. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, I can, and I have happy memories over many years of campaigning with uh, my old friend in Bexley uh, and, and seek up. And I, I can tell him that we are delivering on our agenda uh, for the people of, of London, putting 20,000 more police out on the street and making sure that they get to outer London boroughs uh, as well, uh, and making sure that Londoners do not suffer from the crazed outer London tax. Uh, that, would, that would see motorists, motorists penalised by the Labour Mayor for driving into, the, driving into their own city. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Cherwell Larder in Kidlington does incredible work serving nearly 2,000 of my most vulnerable constituents, but at the moment there simply isn't enough food to go around. And this is a national crisis. Stock for charities like Fair Share is down 30%, in part due to the same supply chain issues that are affecting supermarkets. So will the Prime Minister help the Cherwell Larder, firstly by restoring the funding to Fair Share, but also what more can he do to incentivise businesses to give away surplus food this winter so that no family need go hungry this Christmas? Yeah. Prime Minister. I, I want to thank her for, for raising Fair Share and, and what they're doing to, uh, to support uh, people uh, this, this winter and, and, and indeed at all times. But I would also say that my experience of of businesses that they do an amazing job of, of contributing uh, to this effort. Uh, Iceland is one of the companies that, that springs to mind. Uh, but to the, on the on the uh, on the supply chains, uh, the uh, we are we are addressing it n night and day, and we are seeing uh, some of the some of the uh, the problems starting to ease. They are uh, they are the result, uh, Mr. Speaker, of the uh, British and the world economy coming back into life, uh, which quite frankly would not have happened if we listened to the gentleman opposite. Right? Just a Thank you, Mr Speaker. My Honourable Friend, the Prime Minister, was bang on on Monday when he spoke about ending the unfairness of our high energy intensive industries paying more than they pay overseas. So we know he is a friend to steel in Scunthorpe, so will he continue to do all that he can to ensure that my world-class steelmakers are on a fair footing? 
Yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah, I, I thank I thank my honourable friend and everything she does for for for, for Steele uh, and for Scunthorpe. And uh, I can I can tell her that uh, I, I do believe that uh, British Steel uh, has suffered as a result of decisions taken taken years and years ago uh, from uh, from unfair energy costs. We need to fix it. And this government is getting on and making a, another of the long term changes. Where we're instituting, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we're, we're putting in the nuclear baseload that this country has long been deprived of. John Speller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister, in a couple of weeks' time, I'll be introducing a bill to ban the import of hunting trophies. Not only does that have widespread public support and support from opposition parties, but in the past the principle has been supported by Conservative manifestos, the Queen's Speech, and indeed by yourself. So, Prime Minister, on Friday the 10th of December, will you tell your whips not to block the bill, but to let it go forward so we can work together and end this vile train as soon as possible? Uh, the, the, the Honourable Gentleman is completely right, and uh, that's why we're going to introduce legislation uh, this Parliament to ban, uh, to ban the import of hunting trophies uh, and delivering the change uh, that we promised, and I hope uh, that he will support it. Sir Mike Penning. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister cheered all of my constituents up when he came to South West Hertfordshire and said we were going to have a new hospital. Um, sadly, Prime Minister, even though the money is there, the local management of our trust have blocked it. They're going to refurbish Watford and not give us a brand new hospital on a greenfield site, which is what we want. Prime Minister, will you meet me and some of my constituents to unblock this and tell the NHS they need to build a new hospital for Hemel Hempstead? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I'm grateful to our friend. I do, I do remember the, uh, the issue being raised with, with me when I was uh, when I was with him, I'd be very happy to secure uh, a, a meeting with uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State uh, for Health, and, and I, I'm sure we'll be able to unblock things one way or the other. Tom Nicholson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Scots stood slack jawed this week with astonishment at the news that the Prime Minister has abandoned his DUP bridge to Northern Ireland. Uh, perhaps he'll offer hot air balloons for the crossing instead and inflate them himself. Broken bridge promises to Scotland, broken rail promises to Northern England. With buyer's remorse consuming the Tory backbenchers, who does he think will be defenestrated first, his hapless Tory leader in Scotland or himself? Oh. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I just want to re remind the Scottish Nationalist Party that they are there to represent the people of Scotland and to deliver better services, uh, better transport, better health care. Be and and what, we are what we are delivering, uh, he, talks about, he talks about transport, Mr Speaker. I, I'll, I'll tell him what I, I said to the, the, to the leader of the, of the SNP in, in Westminster. What we are delivering is the first thoroughgoing review of union connectivity so that we look properly at all those roads, the A75, the A77, the A1, all those, all those vital connections for the people of Scotland that have been neglected by the SNP that this government is going to fix. Final question, Marilyn Kay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm absolutely delighted with the half a billion pound start for life funding that was announced in the budget. And my right honourable friend knows from personal experience how important those early years are, whether that's parenting advice, access to healthcare, or age appropriate theme parks. <laughs> um, so, does he agree that rolling out family hubs to 75 local authority areas is a great start? But can he confirm that if this is a successful programme, the government's aim is to roll it out across the whole country? Prime Minister. Yes. I, I, I thank her very much, and she's totally right in what she says about Start for Life. And I'm just seeing if my, uh, my right honourable friend is uh, still in her place, which she's vanished. But I, I want to I thank uh, uh, my right honourable friend, the, the member for Northampton, because she has uh, championed this for many, many years. She is right. Uh, Mr. Speaker, investment in kids' early years is absolutely crucial. That's why this government has, has begun Start for Life. And yes, if it works, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, we will roll it out across the country. 